Arteta! What a strike! is the itsy bitsy teeny weeny shriveled cojones of Troy Deeney that we're talking about on the Arsenal Vision podcast today. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. I was going to sing that. Uh, I thought better of it. I probably should have thought better the whole thing, but enough about that. Let's talk about the podcast. Uh, We are discussing Arsenal's away victory, it says here. Let me check that. Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. Away victory. That's what it says. Uh, So we're going to discuss that and we're going to discuss it with Tim. You can find him on Twitter. Stoberto. Hello, Tim. Hello there. And Andrew, you can find him on Twitter at Arsblog. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Elliot. Yeah, you, should I, have sung it. Yeah. you should have sung it. I should have sung it. He wore a... No, no. no. no don't, <laughs> don't sing it. Don't sing it. Don't sing it. <laughs> yeah, it would have been your fault. Um, yeah, no, I, this, this is one of those weird situations where we get to discuss a victory as though it was probably a loss um, in some ways. <laughs> and I, I have to admit, Andrew, I listened to the Arscast, obviously, as mm. everybody listening to this will have done. And I thought James was a bit sanguine on the whole thing. So hopefully this will give you the opportunity to unleash the other side of your reaction to the match, um, which is sort of how, how we do things over here. I'm sure Tim is not nodding in agreement. Um, but, but Tim, let me start with you just for a second. Mm. You remember that part of the game where the referee blew his whistle and it was over? Uh, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that reminds me of the uh, the Chris Farley skit. You remember from Saturday Night Live with, <laughs> with uh, Paul McCartney? Um, no, I, I mean, all kidding aside, I think this whole match has to be viewed through the lens of having the Napoli tie bookending this game, and especially mm. given that we're playing, we were playing on a Monday with a Thursday away leg in mind, and I, I think that's certainly a part of it. But, I, I mean, the obvious interesting decision here was to go with a back four with Mavropanos included. And I mean, I think Mm. everything that was challenging about this match, including the substitution patterns flowed from that. So for you, do you think this entire match has to be viewed through the lens of that choice and, and the desire, you know, the, obviously the ban for Socrates and the desire to stay fresh for Thursday? I I think so. Yeah. Because if you look at someone like Kolasinac, for example, could have come in um, and would have had a little bit more experience back there in defense and also, you know, a, a, a couple of the substitutions, I think, would have been pre-planned to some extent. Um, I think he probably knew Mavropanos. He wasn't going to get 90 minutes out of Mavropanos, um, albeit, you know, he, he did look a bit rusty, which he can't, that can't have come as a massive surprise. So whether it was, uh, you know, 65 minutes and I'm taking him off or, uh, or he's really beginning to look a bit wobbly now, I better take him off like that. That can't have been an enormous surprise to him. Um, and I think, obviously, Aaron Ramsey as well. He probably always... I mean, he he rarely gives Ramsey 90 minutes, actually, regardless of the situation. But um, particularly with Thursday in mind, where I think we're... I mean, I, th- I kind of think we need Ramsey in every game at the moment. He's, he's growing in, por- in importance so much. But um, I, I think that was always going to be, like, quite an early substitution. He said something about... Terrera as well, um, you know, having a, a bit of a knock um, from the other night. So whether he plans to take him off at half time or not, probably not. But maybe he didn't have the full ninety minutes uh, earmark for him. So I think there was quite a lot going on. And to be honest, I don't think that's massively unusual for Emery. I said on the last podcast, I I don't really look at um, his his selections as elevens anymore. I look at them more as fourteens because I think there is an element of pre-planning um, to some of the substitutions and, and the way he likes to do things. But what was kind of weird about this game was I think one of his substitutions, which I'm sure we'll get onto, just came really, really out of left field and I think completely destabilised the team at our most comfortable and threatening moment in the game. Um, and that, to me, suggests that uh, definitely the fact that the Napoli tie is sitting in there, of course, that's going to have an effect. And you saw like Man United on Saturday didn't play well at all against uh, against West Ham. Um, Spurs were quite lucky because they had Huddersfield at home. Mm. Um, but a lot of the teams with these European ties coming up, you know, weren't amazing and obviously had a, a bit of an eye on them. Um, but. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm sure this will come out in the conversation. I do think the away form thing is probably in Emery's head more than it's in anyone else's. Hmm. And uh, that, that does make me worry a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's interesting too, right? Because like, I thought that 
some of this was was also influenced by the fact that we went up a goal early and then up a man. And mm. I imagine that Emery was probably planning for a really tough battle, keep it <clears throat> keep yeah. it as tight as we could early, you know, maybe try to win it late. And instead he has a lead and a man advantage. And I'm not sure he totally knew how to react to that. I, I think no. similarly. Well, because Tim, if I think about the Ren game, the away leg, you know, we came out so dominantly there and I think he wasn't sure how to react to going up uh, yeah, down, yeah. A man, down a man. There was a similar issue. The game changed so substantially from maybe expectations that it, it probably threw off what he had planned. We, we, we've seen this quite a lot. First of all, um, when Emery's teams go ahead, they don't tend to like, you know, put the boot on the neck. They do, even against Huddersfield, they kind of wind it in a bit and try and hit on the counter. I'm, I'm not sure that really works. What I thought was kind of happening um, in the first half was, uh, or at the end of the first half, I had a conversation with some friends at half time, and they were a bit like, you know, why aren't we going for them? Why aren't we like really pressing the advantage? And I kind of said, well, I, the way I read it is the Deeney sending off hasn't really changed anything for Watford, mm -hmm. certainly not defensively. They've still got their four midfielders and four centre halves, and they're still letting us have the ball, which was probably their game plan anyway. It just meant they carried a little less threat going forward. But other than that, nothing really changed. And I thought what we were doing was waiting for Watford to blink and thinking, right, they can't go on like this for the whole game. At some point, they're going to have to take a bit of a gamble and put that second forward on. And I thought that's what we were waiting for. I thought we were waiting for them to blink. But the exact moment that they put them forward on, that was exactly when we made that really confusing substitution, which um, I don't know if the cameras picked this up inside the ground. The players, like a good minute after play had restarted, Koscielny was, you know, still talking to the bench. They didn't understand what was happening. So I don't think that that was a scenario they were talked through. Um, I think that was probably a little bit off off the dome piece um, from memory. <laughs> but I, I also think you make an interesting point there. As part of my theory of why Arsenal suffer away from home is that Arsenal like the game to conform to a pattern throughout. And when the record skips a little bit, um, they can't really handle it. They can't handle a change in temperature um, in the game. And actually, that doesn't happen at home. Even if we go 1-0 down, it doesn't really change the pattern of the game. We still control it. And, and to all intents and purposes, it doesn't change. That doesn't happen away from home. And so what tends to happen away from home is we look all right at 0-0. But once either team scores, we look and, and it creates like a frisson in the game. We look we look quite suspect. And mm. I think kind of what happened here was that that crease in the pattern of the game all happened in the first five minutes. And I think you're right. We didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting, too. I, th this is something that I, I had to double check it and I didn't because I'm uh, not thorough or detail oriented. Uh, <laughs> but I read that we are we have won every game following a Europa League tie. Um, and that Chelsea have not won any. Um, and, and I think that that is, you know, telling because that, that's really tricky. The one thing you're always told is that you, the Europa League spikes your domestic season. Um, now, admittedly, we had the extra day this time because it was on a Monday, but, you, you know, we expended a lot of energy and had to rotate pretty heavily for this game as a result of it and Socrates' ban. And, you know, I, I think we have to give credit where it's due for getting results on the back of Europa League ties. We, we know from Champions League experience heavy sigh, um, that, that that was just as difficult. So, Andrew, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, I, I feel very strongly influenced this game is the back four he chose. Now, he picked a back four at Spurs, and that worked really well, and I'm sure, you know, he looked at how the back three performance shaped up against Everton, and that informed some of his decision. I don't think he necessarily had the personnel to choose from against Watford to even go with a back three for the whole game if he wanted to. But mm. I, I think a really underrated part of this story is he played Mustafi at right back, which is a very, very, very conservative selection in terms of our attacking play. Um, and I think it really impacted Mkhitaryan's ability to get into the match too because he just didn't have that supply line. Um, you know, and we missed Kolasinac on the left because Nacho Monreal, who I like and have a lot of time for, is getting up there. And I, I think we would agree that Kolasinac is, is more of an, an attacking force. So you had more conservative fullbacks. And I think Emery may have made the Mustafi selection with the Mavropanos start in mind, the idea that a, a more experienced, albeit uh, man wearing clown shoes, central defender in Mustafi could help urge or, or uh, 
nudge Mavropanos <clears throat> through the match a little better than young Ainsley Maitland Niles. You know, if you sure. have a Maitland Niles and Mavropanos <clears throat> right side of your defense, that, that that could be really challenging. So, I mean, do you think that maybe the selection of two fullbacks who are have played a lot as center backs and one who is a center back and their lack of attacking impetus was also maybe a part of why, you know, we looked a little bit different in the way we built play. Maybe. I think uh, that's a good point. You know, when he picked Mavropanos, I was a bit surprised, but he sandwiched him between two experienced players. Um, Kashalny to his left uh, is the captain and, and Mustafi to the right, who is obviously a very experienced player, uh, regardless of what, what kind of shoes he's wearing. Um, you know, it, it worked well enough playing Mustafi at right back against Spurs, and I thought we were very good in that game. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that it was just the fullbacks that was the problem. I think Tim hits on a really interesting point where he says, as soon as the needle skips were, were not great, we're not good improvisers under Unai Emery. And, you know, we can talk about Arsene Wenger and the way that his team set up, but there was an element of improvisation to the way that we played that was often uh, present in our performances that isn't necessarily there with Emery because we know he's this pragmatic coach. He's very uh, regimented. Uh, you know, he practices these drills and, and wants his team to play in a certain way. So when all of a sudden we don't have to play exactly that way, I'm not sure we know how, how to cope with it. I think the sending off really had a strange effect on us because we'd just gone ahead. I wonder what we would have been like if we hadn't just scored when the sending off happened um, because we wouldn't have had anything to rest on. You know, we would have we would have seen it as a chance to really turn the screw a bit on Watford. Instead, we had this goal advantage. It was a strange goal. We were Everyone was just kind of coming to terms with that. And then we go up a man, and I think it's not so much that we took our foot off the pedal, but there was no need to put our foot back on the pedal, if you like. Uh, and it wasn't a surprise to me when he changed things at, at half time. So I think it was more of um, an attitude thing rather than, than a, a personnel issue. I do take your point about, you know, Mustafi and Monreal don't give you as much going forward as Kalasinac and, and Maitland-Niles, albeit when they play as, as wingbacks rather than, rather than fullbacks. Um, so to, to sum up, I, I think it might have been a factor, but I don't think it was the main reason why we were so poor in that first half. And, mm. and, and throughout the second, I mean, I think Tim hit on the main thing in the second half was, was the weird change, which uh, took the momentum from the performance that we'd had uh, uh, just after the break. Yeah, and I, I presume you're, you're talking about, obviously, the, the uh, Genduzzi for, for Maverick yeah. Pano switch. Yeah, well, before we get that, and it ties into what you're saying about not improvising as well under Emery, but I think... You know, Emery is football. We, we've joked about it, and it's become <clears throat> sort of like a meme at this point, the idea that get it to the wingbacks for, you know, crosses and cutbacks into the box. But yeah. the reason it's kind of become a meme is because it, there is a, a bit of truth to it. And so I think when you shut down that supply, the the wide supply, you know, the players that suffer are the wide forwards, like Mkhitaryan I, I thought was particularly absent in this game. And while I don't think he was particularly great when he was on the ball in the first half, in particular when he was playing with Mustafi the most, the longest period of time where we were playing with that formation, he had like, you know, a dozen, 15 touches, something like that. He just found it really hard to get into the game. And, I, you know, we are not a team that really emphasizes midfield possession. You know, under Arsene Wenger, we had 60, 65% possession, and we'd have, you know, two midfielders make 100 passes in a game like this, or even three. You know, Ozil, Ramsey, and, and Torreira would have all had you know, a uh, hundred passes in this game or Shaka, I, sh I should say, but mm. like we're, we're just not built to play that way. And so I, I thought that, you know, with two fullbacks that didn't add that supply, it, it didn't really give us a, a, a way to dominate the game. And one thing that I did want to ask you about, because I listened to the Ars cast obviously, and, and you know, Emery said after the game that he made the Torreira switch because of the environment that Torreira was feeling a little pain, but the environment mm. of the game was against him. And I think you and James had said that you sort of, you know, you don't buy that argument. Um, and I have slightly a different take on it. I, I, I actually, while I was watching the match, was really nervous about that because every time he committed a foul, the crowd was trying to get him carded. But it wasn't just the referee that I think was under pressure to even up the game, which they sometimes feel. I thought the Watford players were really targeting him. That They felt that he had bought the red card, which obviously is not the case. He took an elbow from Deeney, who totally deserved it and has said that he tries to whack Arsenal players and, and he got caught. But... 
I thought that he was being targeted for physicality. And so do you think that the whole environment of the game thing might have been to protect him from that? Because he was taking some very, very heavy, heavy challenges throughout the first half. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I didn't consider that. I thought, you know, when he said it afterwards, it was a case that the the barracking that he was getting from the, you know, the vicious, brutish Watford fans. <laughs> yeah, was, no, that I agree is <laughs> not a point. Yet. Somehow affecting him. I, I didn't think that at all. And, you know, I didn't think he was being uh, or was worried at all about the, the physical attention he was getting. It didn't occur to me that he might have been just protecting him uh, from, from a good clumping. He got one, actually from Ducouré maybe and it was it was a late challenge it was studs on the on the shin you know yeah thankfully off the ground right yeah yeah surprised it wasn't a yellow and you know it's one of those challenges that people will say well you know it could easily have been a red card so that that hadn't occurred to me I knew he had to change something at halftime though I think we all could see that something needed to give at halftime and you know whatever his rationale for taking Torreira (laughs) off putting Ozil on was not a negative in any way. I mean, you're bringing on a playmaker, a creative player, a visionary, a visionary player. You're asking him to maybe come on and dictate or influence the game. I'm not sure that that he did that, but we did have our best spell of the game in the the first 15 minutes of the second half, and and then we get to to that weird change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and I I just think you know for me if you're if you're looking at Torreira being someone who's recently back, who you're trying to protect and he's coming in for rough treatment, and you have you know, every foul that he commits or every time he's involved in a challenge, you have the fans sort of shouting off, 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 you know, like idiots. Like, I don't, I don't think it was necessarily that it was an emotional, emotionally challenging environment for Torreira so much as the risk of keeping him on did not outweigh uh, or did outweigh the reward in this case because I think Emery would have felt that bringing on Ozil for Torreira with a, a goal advantage and a man advantage would have been a very safe switch. So... Tim, I I think, you know, to me, the other reason I like that switch is I felt that what we needed more of was control. And one of the things that really Mm. worried me in this game, you know, if you look at XG, I think they were at about a goal of XG. We were at about two. Um, You know, overall, we created the much better chances. But the thing that I think had people being very nervous about this game in general was just the amount of times that the game felt very open, Um, that Mm. they were running at us with a numerical advantage, that... For a game where we had a man advantage, we weren't able to exert control. And I thought that bringing in Ozil would do that, and it did briefly, but not enough. I mean, for you, was the really big concern in this game mainly just that we never seemed able to put our foot on the ball, hold possession for long spells, and really just slow the game down and and kill it? I mean, we've seen this team do it before. I think it was against Chelsea in the 2-0 win where the second half we just took the air air out of the ball completely. We weren't able to do that. Yeah, and we did, we did it against United at home as well. Yeah, We've good, been quite good, good at that at home, like just closing games out. And, and to some extent, I think that's what we were trying to do here. But I thought we were kind of trying to do it the wrong way. There were loads of, like even from Jacker, loads of backwards passes, which is really not like him. Um, loads of like just passing it back to the back four. And, and I guess that's just because Watford didn't really have anyone up there for the first kind of 65 minutes or so. But... I, I think the longer the half went on, the more the whole away form thing became a thing, that it became a psychological thing, that with 20, 25 minutes to go, they realised that Watford hadn't given up, and that Watford weren't just going to kind of meekly accept a 1-0 defeat. And Which I, is I super do think, annoying, by the way. I mean, yeah, they're, they're yeah. in the FA Cup final. I mean, throw us a bone, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, but you know that that's one of the 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 kind of the consequences of having such poor away form. Um, you know, you don't you don't invite um, that kind of fear um, and team and and that's uh, as much as I think it's a little bit of a barrier uh, crossed getting that three points. It's still, you know, it, if if by some miracle we go two 0 up against like Leicester or Wolves or whatever, they're, they're not going to lie down. They're still going to think that there's. A fragility to this Arsenal team. Whereas if we go 2 0 up at the Emirates, I think teams are far more likely to just say, right, let's just keep the score down now. Um, so I, I think, it, I, like I say, I think that substitution kind of unbalanced us. I think also the manager had to correct it and that denied us um, the chance to bring Lacazette on, who I think might have helped to get a measure of control, particularly the way that Ozil and Lacazette combine. 
because what what was happening basically was we had Iwobi, who I thought was maybe our best player on the night, um, although that was a fairly low bar, um, hmm. <laughs> and, and it was quite it yeah. was quite harem scarum because it was Iwobi like skipping down the left flank and trying to get a cut back, and you know with Abamyang obviously you're looking to play on the counter and, and, and unfortunately he was offside about 150 times. <laughs> And, you know, you give Ozil the ball in that situation. And as and I agree with you, I liked that change at halftime. But I think one of the reasons it didn't bring a measure of control is because then when Ozil looks up, he's trying to play a through ball to a Bamiyang. So he's trying to, like, thread the needle a little bit. Whereas, um, which, which, you know, all, all of this really should have gotten us another goal because we, we were set up for the counter-attack. But... I think we got caught somewhere between trying to counter-attack and, like you say, trying to have that element of control, which we didn't really have with the players we had on the pitch. I think maybe if you get Ozil and Lacazette, um, maybe the goal threat is slightly less in this scenario, but you probably keep better control of the ball, whereas our goal threat was probably, at least in theory, increased by having someone like Iwobi running at them, Ozil looking to thread balls to Aubameyang, Aubameyang running in behind, but... We just didn't quite get it right. Um, and that led to a bit of a basketball game, um, basically, in the middle of the game. And I, I, I've got a little bit of sympathy with that because I kind of think if you get the second goal and if Mkhitaryan's not wearing clogs, we would have got the second goal. And then you look at that and you say, yeah, there we go. We played on the counter. We waited our time. We we cut them open and we took our chance. But uh, and then I think for the last kind of 15, 10, 15 minutes, it just really went to pot technically. And I think that was possibly part fatigue. But I think a lot of that was um, the realisation dawning on them that they were close to, you know, actually winning a, a game away from home. And I, I do think there was a psychological element towards the end. Yeah, I think that's well said. You know, the, the one thing that I think is really interesting here is the – the way we play with a lone striker versus with Aubameyang and Lacazette together, and obviously after the match, Aubameyang said he likes playing with Lacazette. But, you know, what what is interesting is that before the Bate loss in Belarus, um, he had played Lacazette and uh, Aubameyang together as strikers the majority of the games. Um, I, I believe they had played like seven, yeah, exactly, seven of the previous eight Premier League fixtures they had started together. Um after that, he started with a lone striker, five of the seven fixtures. And I think the big difference is Mkhitaryan. So during that run where he played both strikers together for seven of eight Premier League fixtures, Mkhitaryan was not available. In the five out of eight where he played with a lone striker, Mkhitaryan was available. And I think that Emery probably looks at this team without Mkhitaryan and says, if I don't play both strikers, I don't have enough directness and goal threat and end product. Mm. Um, in Mkhitaryan... Mkhitaryan, however you want to say it, who cares? You know, say it's your it's your life. Say the names the way you want to say them. Um, I think with Mkhitaryan, he he feels that he has that extra end product and directness. And and prior to the Everton game, that had been the case. Uh, you know, he had yeah. been among our best in terms of xG ninety, xA ninety, goals assists since he'd come back from injury. In this game, I thought he was poor as he was yeah. in the Everton game, and I think that lack of influence was a big, big part of why the attack didn't fire. So, yeah. yeah go, yeah, to, and he, he, well, Mkhitaryan in many ways sums this team up. Um, he, he reminds me a bit of Kolasinac in that we've got a lot of quite inconsistent players. And Mkhitaryan's one of them. Um, his ceiling's very high, but he can have some stinkers as well. And there doesn't seem to be any pattern as to why. I, I'd just say, I, I think uh, Michael Cox made a really, really good point in his um, match report where I think we've been playing up a lot of the positives of having Lacazette and Aubameyang and rightly so. But he was saying actually that this, the one of the consequences of kind of rotating, either playing them together or playing one or the other is that the team never actually adjusts to its focal point because we chop and change every game. And I, I think that's a really, a, a really well-made point. And I, I do think that in the second half, maybe that played into things a little bit. They did, you know, the team didn't quite appreciate that they were playing with a Bamiyang, who's not a controlling player. They were playing with a, a counter-attacking striker yeah. and, and we haven't really settled into that pattern. Yeah. I think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And it, it is interesting to some extent that when Mkhitaryan starts, it's usually with Aubameyang up front. And I, I think that Emery probably sees there being a partnership dating back to Dortmund. And, you know, he, he believes that there's a relationship between the two of them. But in general, 
I, I just don't think that the front three were on the same wavelength. And, and Andrew, you know, one of the things that has become a feature of debating any Arsenal team, but this one in particular, is you know people have players that they love or hate. There are always going to be some polarizing figures, and one of them is a <laughs> Wobi. Um, I, I think you see a Wobi, you see an a Wobi performance depending on which part of the game you focus on. If you focus on involvement, activity, influence, I think you're going to be really impressed with Iwobi. If you focus on the end of any involvement he has, I think that's mm. where you can be frustrated by Iwobi. And I thought this was a quintessential sort of um, Schrodinger's Iwobi game because uh, he was our best player in many ways in terms of his involvement uh, and and his ability to to carry the ball into the final third and create chances and opportunities, I also thought he was uh, not as clinical as he should have been with some of those opportunities. Obviously, the one that sticks out is the drive he had early in the game where he carried the ball all the way into the final third. I think it was a four-on-two for Arsenal, and he wound up holding the ball too long, so he had to shoot. Um, my frustration with this Arsenal team is I think there are just too many attacks that break down for us because we don't turn dangerous situations into really good shooting opportunities. I, I think Awobi, Kolasinac are, are both a little bit guilty of that. So for you with Awobi, I mean, where are you on the spectrum of being impressed by his involvement versus frustrated with what he does when he gets in the final third? Um, I can see both sides of this. You know, there was a real range of opinion when it came to Awobi's performance. I'm just watching this break again here, the one where he ended up taking the shot. I'm not, I mean, I'm just looking at it again. It's People just are not decisive enough, it, is it? Yeah, it's not decisive enough, but I don't think there's anything really 100% on for him in terms of a pass. For a second, there's a pass to uh, to Torreira maybe inside him, and then maybe there's a pass to Ramsey outside him. So I'm not sure it was quite as clear-cut as as we would have liked it to be. In the end, he got a shot on target, and and that's fair enough. I absolutely take the point that he is somebody whose end product could do with improving. You know, I, I think that really does frustrate people. Um, and then when you tell people after the game, you know, he created seven chances for us on the night. Um, they're taken aback a little bit by how much he's involved. And obviously the one that he set up for Mkhitaryan, which should have been a goal in, in the second half, that was the the one that stands out in everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I like that he he gets involved, and I like that he tries to make things happen, and particularly in the first half when there wasn't a lot going on from an attacking point of view uh, for Arsenal. He seemed to be the one guy who was looking to make things happen and didn't often have maybe the right support to, uh, you know, to find the passes. And then you ask the question, well, you know, if he did, would he be able to find those passes anyway? So that's kind of where I am with him. I, I, I see a lot of strengths to his game, but I think we're at a point now with him where it feels like he needs to take a bit of a step forward when he's in the opposition final third, because I think his awareness is better. His strength is better. The way he holds the ball up, particularly with his back to goal is better. He gives us a bit of an outlet, a physical outlet at times, which we don't have a great deal of in this team. You know, without um, your old pal Giroud, you know, we don't have somebody who we can hit a long ball to, really. I, I loved him as a plan B. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 fine. I, I, I'm only winding you up, really. But, yeah, you know, that, that's an element of a Wobie's game that I think he's made progress in. But when you're being played as an attacking player or somebody, you know, in a front three, you have to start producing in the final third. And, you know, we could say, we could sit here and say, look, actually, he should have had an assist if, if Mkhitaryan had had more conviction in the finish uh, for the chance that he set him up. And, and, you know, the stats tell us that, you know, he made seven chances. I think what our eyes tell us is that he's still a, a player who, who isn't quite as confident as you would like him to be at key moments. And I think when you've got a, when you've got somebody like Mkhitaryan in the team as well, who's hit and miss, who can be really good, but who can also stink the place out, as I thought he did. Um, I'm not sure you can have both of those players in the team at the same time. And the thing about the way Emery uses Iwobi and Mkhitaryan is that they, they're a bit of a duo. Uh, he tends to uh, pick them both together. So 
there's no margin for error when Iwobi can't produce and Mkhitaryan is is playing the way he plays. Yeah. Do you know what? I go ahead. Yeah. I, I just interject on Iwobi because I, I I think I'm probably someone who's more in the pro Iwobi camp, but I think I'll be able to evaluate him better when we have another player like that because I think his importance is possibly inflated by the fact that we mm. really really need more players like him. And whether he is quite of the vintage that we require, I think personally I'll be able to make a better judgment when we perhaps get one or two more guys who don't mind trying to beat a man and and kind of taking the game to opponents at the moment. I think probably his importance is outsized by the fact that he's the only player like that we have and we desperately need more of them. Yeah. And, and look, he's an academy player and you want to root for those kind of players. I, I think the only thing that is difficult for me is is he still a young player? I mean, he's played a lot of first team football. He's, you know, he's had no shortage of opportunity and experience. I think at this stage of his career, because Tim, you've always berated me in the past, um, as as many people do, uh, but in this particular case, about the idea that finishing tends to come a little later in in a player's yeah. development, and that what they do in front of goal comes a little bit later. And I fully take you on, on your point that 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 is the case. I guess what I'm saying is, do any of us believe there is a prolific goal scorer or prolific end product player in Iwobi just waiting to burst out? I don't don't think we see signs of that, right? It it also depends on what we want him to be and what kind of system he's playing in. The thing is, as well, players can be really, really useful without being outstanding, depending on how the team is set up. So. The Darren um, Fletcher type player. I'm not, not I, saying Obi is Darren Fletcher, but no, a guy that does a great job, you know, week in, week out, and can be I an was, important part of a squad uh, throughout. Yeah, a season, yeah. Well, actually, the player. The the, adv- the um the example I was going to use was Jesse Lingard. Now, Jesse yeah. Lingard is not an outstanding footballer, but in certain great scenarios, great dancer, though. He, yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. In certain scenarios, he's very valuable to the way that Man United set up, particularly if they're playing on the counter. He's not a brilliant footballer. You wouldn't like. I can't really list his qualities, to be honest with you. I can't say, oh, he's got a great right foot or he's a great passer. But he, in certain scenarios, he is a really valuable player for them without being a superstar. And and maybe Iwobi will become that type of player. Maybe you won't. We. We don't really know yet. So he, he might not be a prodigy um, of any sort. I, the, the, the kind of example I, I guess I always use is Thomas Rosicki, who who's a, a really good footballer, not an elite world-class footballer, but a good footballer and one that was actually really, really valuable to Arsenal. Again, because he was kind of the only player of his type. And again, that kind of outsized his, um, his contribution, I think, and I'm not saying he's not talented. He was very talented, but mm. his contribution outsized his talent because he was what Arsenal needed. Yeah, I feel the same way about Thierry Henry. Um, so, <laughs> Can I just uh, make a point on Iwobi? I mean, I yeah, think sure. I, I'm, I, I'd be really happy if Iwobi was part of our squad for the next mm. two or three or five seasons, whatever it is. I mean, I think there's a good enough player in there. You know, he's played nearly 150 games now for Arsenal. And... You know, you you say, can we consider him a young player? At 22, I think he is still young, but he's an established first-team player now, and that maybe changes the expectations. Uh, I I do think there's an element of him playing as much as he does because Danny Welbeck is not there. I think when we look to build a squad for next season, you know, having another player who can can do what Iwobi does... Uh, is really important when it comes to the transfer market. I'm not convinced he's going to be a wide player for his entire career. I think at some point he's going to move more more centrally. Yeah, um, I agree. But, you know, I don't really feel the need to sort of write him off or, or anything like that yet. I think he can be a very useful squad player. Maybe he'll take that step forward and become... Uh, a first team pick week in week out maybe he will maybe he won't but i still think that he's got a lot to contribute yeah, um, yeah. To, I, to this club. i don't you know the, and the problem is these these debates become so binary right i mean he's mm. he's class or he's shit and that's that's just not what it has to be i think the point is if i said to anyone we're gonna go out and buy a really supremely talented goal scoring wide forward this summer i don't think anyone would say no don't do that it's gonna kill a Wobie. you know i think people recognize that that's an area of need um 
Well, well before we take a break, Andrew, I, I do want to get your, your take on one other performance. And it's, you know, again, we're going to talk young players that people have high expectations for. I'm sort of confused about Mavropanos because he played, I think, two Premier League games last season when he got sent off. Uh, the first one he, he looked really good in. And I understand mm. that he's had some impressive performances in games I haven't watched, uh, youth youth games and things like that. I am not by any means suggesting he is not a talented player who could be very good for us. But for some reason, people seem to have an opinion of him that he is a player who can step into the first team and play for us right now and, and <laughs> is the solution we need at center back. And I just don't fully understand how that hype has developed. And I thought that this game was a very big reminder of the distance between where he is in reality and where he needs to be if he wants to play for Arsenal regularly. I thought he struggled. And the thing that surprised me also is he's a player who a lot of people have had a high regard for his on-the-ball play, his his passing and his control of the ball, his use of the ball. I didn't really see that in this game, and I saw a lot of nerves and, and decision-making issues. Now, again, I'm not killing the kid. He's not someone who is a first-team player right now. But the reason I bring it up is because I think there are a lot of people that believe he could be. So do you think this game is sort of definitive proof for the moment that Mavropano still has a lot of development to do before we can really see him as part of the first team? Yeah, look, I think n- not so much a definitive, whatever it was you just said, but more a reality check. Sorry, you can just the say, word, just just say it better. Mind. Yeah, just say it better. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I just think it's a reality check about who he is and what we expect from him. And I think, you know, we we part of the hype, I think, is because when he came it was a Sven Mislintat signing and Wenger was a little bit sniffy about it. And he called him, what did he say? This, this Greek boy, I think he said, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's going to go out on loan. And then he saw him and went, actually, yeah, he's quite good. But you know, the two games he played last season, maybe one was against Manchester United. It could have been, um, but you know, Never last heard of season, uh, yeah, last season was just, we were going through the motions at that point in the premier league. He got sent off in the game against Leicester and ever since Arsenal have had defensive issues, we had defensive issues under Wenger, defensive issues under Unai Emery. We've struggled to maintain any kind of cohesive back four or back three unit. You know, it's always chopping and changing through injury or suspension. And we're looking for something, anything that will make us better. And I think a lot of people went, well, you know, Mavropanos, it's got to be, it's got to be him. Um, you know, l- let's be realistic. This was his fourth start for Arsenal. And he's, what, a 20-year-old, 21-year-old central defender. Uh, he, he's he got a long way to go. And I, I, I think your point about the way uh, that he passed the ball was interesting to me because I didn't see him as confident. He looked nervous. Mm-hmm. Even when we were playing with a man advantage, you know, there was an element of him. I think he was kind of deferring a little bit too much to the player's Uh, either side of him, you know, Mustafi and and Koscielny, who I know were there to nurse him through the game. But, um, you know, with the ball, I'm I'm not sure he was quite as as good as we we would have hoped. Look, be realistic. How can we make any definitive judgment on a player of his age uh, being played, uh, I guess, so irregularly that we, we just have no idea what kind of a player he is yet? Now, I think I said on the Arscast, there is at least some show of faith in him or 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 his ability or his quality that the emery was prepared to play him away from home against watford against a team that he knew was going to be physical and difficult and quick uh, andre gray is very quick dini is physical away from home you know we're so bad away from home um in a back four maybe we can read something into that that he was prepared to play him but i think we saw from the way that he played there's a long way to go in terms of what he's got to learn. And uh, and I think people really do need to temper their expectations of him. Um, maybe we'll need him between now and the end of the season, but uh, he might even play on Sunday against Crystal Palace because of the way things are working out. Mm. But, you know, I think as long as everybody else is fit, and that includes Mustafi, he's not going to be in the team. And I think that's probably probably right. Yeah, and, and by the way, I, to be clear, I wasn't killing him or saying he won't no, be good. You, yeah, I you- yeah. I, I'm just saying that, and and you know, a lot of how you feel about narrative or players is what you hear on social media, what you hear, uh, what what you read, what you hear from the, you know the the big J journalists and things like that. And for whatever reason, in sort of my sphere, I have come in contact with a lot of Mavropanos hype. 
So, you know, in my mind, I had built up that there was this player that just needs to get on the pitch and he's going to make a first team place at center back his. And I, I think seeing him play, you just see, no, he's where you'd expect a 20, 21 year old center back to be. And that's quite some way off being ready. So totally fine. Look, I, it is on nearly mother's day here in the United States. Do you guys have mother's day in May? I, uh, I don't know when we have Mother's Day. Okay, so you just missed it. You missed an opportunity, obviously. We have an opportunity here in the United States because with Mother's Day you're coming not, up. You're not, you're not going to sell. Oh, some, oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to sell you some lingerie <laughs> just in time for Mother's Day. Then we'll come back and talk about the substitutions, the second half, and a little look ahead oh. to Ren. We're going to take a break. You can wash your mouth out, do whatever you got to do. We'll be back right after this. Okay, everyone, it's time to tell you about our friends at Enclosed Lingerie. You can find them online at The Enclosed, the E N C L O S E D dot com. Enclosed Lingerie is a Lingerie of the Month Club. That's right, just like a Beer of the Month Club, only better because it's a high end luxury lingerie gift for you and your partner that's going to enhance the intimacy in your relationship. Right now, if you put in Arsenal at checkout, they're going to give you $35 off any gift from Enclosed Lingerie. So you're going to want to go to theenclosed.com and sign up now. What better way to celebrate the romance in your relationship than celebrating with a gift from the enclosed? And the gifts keep coming every month. So while it can be difficult to remember to keep the romance, to keep the intimacy in your relationship, the enclosed has your back. Every month you're going to get that high-end luxury lingerie gift, and it's going to remind you of the importance of romance in your relationship. So do it now. Go to theenclosed.com. There is a perfect fit guarantee, so you never have to worry about the fit. It's beautiful high-end luxury lingerie. Just go to theenclosed.com and enter promo code ARSENAL for $35 off at checkout. Do it now. All right, we're back now that you sorted out for Mother's Day or, you know, if you're not in the U.S. where Mother's Day is coming up, you know, whatever holiday, maybe Father's Day, that's coming up here as well, you know. Either way, no judgments. In any event, uh, let's talk about the substitutions in the second half. And I mean, look, we got through it. I I think, Tim, that the one that's getting a lot of attention is the Ganduzi for Mavropano substitution. And mm. I think it has been referred to on some podcasts as a mistake. I have heard that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't necessarily disagree yeah. with that. But I have sort of an interesting theory about it. The first is, I think Mavropano had to come off. Um, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. think it was like, holy cow, he's a disastrous to come off. But I think it was clear that he was pretty nervous and he he got some minutes under his belt, but it was time to take him off. Now, yeah. what the manager decided to do was to say, okay, I'm going to go with the Mustafi, Koscielny, Nacho Monreal back three. In principle, I don't see that as being off the wall weird. I mean, if he had started with that, I don't think anyone would have thought that was weird. If Cole Sinatra and Maitland Niles had been the wingbacks in that. So he brings on Ganduzi and goes to a back three of three players that should be able to play in the back three. The issue then is he had Mkhitaryan and Awobi as the wingbacks, which obviously was a very weird change, and I'm not sure the players coped with it well. I also thought it was interesting against Napoli when El Nenny came on, Ganduzi looked pissed. He looked unhappy. He and Ozil had a little chat. Ganduzi looked like he was sucking on lemons. He's been in and out of the team a little bit lately. And maybe Emery thought, you know, we need a little more control. He adds that for us. I got to get Mavropanos out and switch to the back three. And this is a chance for me to get Ganduzi on the pitch. So I think there may have been a lot of factors there that yeah. that led him to make this choice. But in and of itself, using a Wobie and Mkhitaryan as wingbacks when you have the extra man you know, he may have felt that the three, he even said it after the game, I thought that the three central defenders would give us enough control and it didn't and he made the change. So can we at least defend it as not, I mean, it was wrong and he fixed it. Yeah, But yeah. It, it's not totally off the wall to think that that back three can work. I mean, he, if he had started with it, we wouldn't have batted yeah. an eyelash. Yeah, yeah. I, d I don't think um, the, the back three was the issue. And the, and the really kind of contrary thing about the substitution is I think you're totally right. Mavropan has had to come off. And like I said at the outset, there, there must have been some expectation that he wasn't going to finish in 90 minutes. And actually, Genduzzi, I thought, played really well when he came on. Um, and I think he did, you know, he was one of the players who was who looked to be trying to give us that bit of control totally that we were agree. lacking. Yep. Mm hmm um, yeah, the issue was the wing backs, not least because Iwobi was was being st the whole game was stationed really, really high up, um, really high up the pitch. And I don't know if they highlighted this on uh, on Sky or any transmission you were watching, but 
for the first time, we we left three players up from Watford's corners. Um, we left Abamyang, Iwobi, and Mikatarian up on the halfway line, which I've never seen us do before. Um, so I'll be I'll be interested to see if we do that again, or whether that's just something they identified with Watford, whether they felt they were susceptible, or whether they just thought it was a bit of a way of clearing out the penalty area because they because uh, they carry a threat from set pieces. I'm not sure, but. Um, like Mikatarian, what was really weird was as wing backs, they were completely lopsided because Mikatarian just went to right back, as far as I could see. He was in line with the central midfielders, but Iwobi didn't really drop to wing back. He was still playing as a winger. So it was really, and you know, Iwobi was on Emery's side as well. So it, it was really, I thought it was quite odd. And like I said, the, the players didn't get it at all. They were they, they were all like motioning to the bench and, um, I think bless him, Gendouzi's English is possibly not quite good enough yet to really relay a detailed tactical instruction um, from the manager because they, they were all kind of looking over, looking very puzzled. So it, it was kind of a weird substitution in that you're right, Mavropanos, I think, had to come off. Putting Gendouzi on wasn't a bad idea and he played well. But yeah, d- doing that with wingback, I, I think like just putting Kalasanach or Maitland-Niles on would have made... well. Quite a this lot is what I was going to ask. If he had just done the Ganduzi and Maitland Niles subs in reverse, we wouldn't be yeah. having this conversation, right? If it yeah, had been indeed, Maitland Niles for Mavropanos and then Ganduzi for Ramsey, we wouldn't be having the conversation. Yeah. Um, and I think he had both of those substitutions in mind and just made them in a very weird order. And mm. so, Andrew, one of the things that I think is very interesting, I have this sort of working theory based entirely on uh, my gut uh, and not you know, anything else, my brain, the, my gut may be more accurate than the latter, but the, the working theory is that I think Emery has become increasingly uh, aggressive with his substitutions as the season has worn on, that he has erred on the side of more attacking substitutions to try to hold points and win games um, than defensive ones. And, and I like it because I think in general what he's maybe realized is getting the extra goal is the best defense for us, that, you know, trying to hold on to a one nil is not a good strategy. And I I, I think that maybe with the Genduzi for Mavropano substitution, he thought, I can still go for it and get that second goal that makes the point safe. It didn't work. And to his mm. credit, he corrected it. He got Maitland-Niles on pretty quickly after for Ramsey. And that, you know, I don't want to say it settled things right down because it never really did, but it worked better. Um, but for you, I mean, do you think that the sub he made and the, the substitution patterns in general from Emery have become increasingly attack oriented and, and aggressive as the season's worn on. Um, I'd actually have to go back and look at the the changes that he's made, and I'm not sure I agree with with you guys about Mavropanos. You thought I, he could have stayed think, on? Yeah, and I don't think that you pick a center half with the idea of only playing him for sixty minutes. I just don't see that as part of a strategy, you know? You can think about changes in the final third, or you can think about changes in midfield, maybe to give you more control, but I find it very hard to imagine that he picked Mavropanos and was only going to play him for an hour. See, particularly. Oh, oh, can, I, can I just interject for one second? I don't personally well, think it was planned. I think he looked like he was struggling and had sure ha- had to be replaced. So I, I think he yeah. made a quick decision after an incident when Mavropanos made a bit of a mistake, a, yeah. a misjudgment, and I think he made his decision based on that. Um, it, it's just that, um, you know, he was never going to play Ramsey for 90 minutes. Yeah. So I think maybe he got a little bit frightened by, by what Mavropanos had, had done and, and sought to correct that, and he got it wrong. And I think maybe you're right. You know, if the changes have been made the other way, there wouldn't be the same discussion or the same talking point, but you know, it did kind of kill our momentum a bit and we had made a couple of really good chances in those first 15 minutes. And as Tim said earlier in the show, it denied us the opportunity to bring on, um, to bring on Lacazette, who I think would have caused Watford a lot more problems. I don't think we would have been quite as worried about the final half an hour if we'd had Lacazette on because I think most of the game would have been played in their final third. We'd have pushed them way, way back as it was. You know, I thought there was an element of of caution, really, to the Genduzi from Avrapanos um, substitution 
I think that instilled a little bit of doubt within the team. Uh, Tim saying, you know, that they weren't quite sure exactly what was going on. In fairness, he did correct it and we were better. But at a key moment in the game, the change that he made put us on the back foot a bit. So I- I'm not sure it-, it could be seen as a an attacking substitution or one that was designed to get us another goal. I think it was it was sort of born out of fear of what might happen to Mavropanos. I think, you know, if it were me and, and uh, you know, obviously it's not uh, up to me. Shame. I think it's, I just, I, <laughs> it's, it's a good job, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, uh, I think I would have left Mavropanos on because, you know, he was, um, he was not necessarily playing that well, but, you know, we were playing against 10 men. I think he had two experienced defenders beside him to, to help him through it. And if we'd had asserted more control, you know, in our own game, then we would have left him uh, less exposed. So I think that's where I am with that. Yeah, and it's not that I disagree. I mean, look, I I like snap judgments more than most, and my snap judgment was like, oh boy, Mavropanos is really struggling in this game. And I didn't think he was really struggling. I just think hmm. he had a couple of moments where his his rawness shone through, and I think that's what informed Emery's decision. You yeah. know, I think it was generally fine, but you could see he was a, a young, inexperienced player. But then what were we expecting? No, it's it. Well, look, it it's not so much the expectation so much as like you're now trying to win a Premier League game that you have a lead and a man advantage. And if you think that he's the most likely to be a problem, then you get him out of the firing line and you, you go on and win the game. And we did. And I I just I agree that the, the, the substitution was wrong. I mean, in, and he admitted it. He said after the game, it didn't work and he changed it. Um, and credit to him for doing that. Uh, I think Maitland Niles from Avrapanos would have been a fine switch and probably the right switch. Um, yeah. And Maitland Niles wound up having a huge, a, a crucial block late in the game to you know preserve the points. So yeah, overall it, it all worked out. I think in c- closing on this game, Tim, there there is an argument that this wasn't as bad a performance as it has been viewed. I mean, we had 19 mm. shots for, you know, we're a team yeah. that averages just under 12 away. I think against Everton, we had eight. Is that right? Seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had 19, five on target. They had 11. Okay. Probably more than you'd like to concede to a team that's down a man, but with 19 shots and the balance of good chances and the Mkhitaryan one that was, you know, point blank and should have made the points safe. And, you know, just a lot of moves that broke down and didn't result in, in in chances when they could have. I mean, is there an argument that while the game was open and that made it feel nervy, we definitely had the lion's share of the good chances, the lion's share of the shots, and that overall we were well worth the three points and that some of the hand-wringing is based more on the fact that the game was a little bit open than it is based on the balance of of who was the better team? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And also it's it's kind of to do with the way it ended um, a little bit as well because it kind of ended with Watford on top. Um, I, I think what you've pointed out there is that the thing that Emery's been battling with all season, do we have more control over the game and fewer shots or do we increase our offensive potential and have less control over the game? This is This is the thing he's been wrestling with all season when he doesn't know whether to play a number 10 or whether to have like three central midfielders um, or whether to have three at the back or four at the back. And he's just kind of wrestling with this balance at the moment. And this this game brought a little bit of that out. Um, I I would say that, um, yeah, it, it probably was a slightly better performance and also the fact that, you know, the away form is such a thing. I think in isolation, you'd say a Monday night away at Watford, who are, I think, eighth in the Premier League, going really well. They've just got to a cup final. Uh, wind in the, you know, the wind's behind them and all of that. And um, we've got a big game in Naples on Thursday night. And we've gone and we've taken a 1-0 and it wasn't pretty, but we took it. And, and I think if our away form was normal... Um, we might take it a little bit more in isolation. But, you know, it's like we were talking about after the Everton game, weren't we? How how difficult is it to separate the away form thing from the performance? Because Everton could just have been a bad day. It might not have anything to do with the fact that we were away from home. I, I don't think I believe that, but it, that could have been uh, what it was. But um, while, while that's like a dominates um, the, 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 the kind of discussion, then... 
that's always going to come out. And, and obviously, you know, when you go one nil up and a man up inside 10 minutes, obviously your expectations rise a little bit. Um, and, you know, th- those expectations kind of lowered more and more as the game went on. I, I will say I thought we saw it out quite well where, you know, that last 15 minutes, like I said, I think we got a bit scared and we decided to defend it. I, I do think we did that really well. And I, I would say as well, um, I, I said this on Twitter, I was I was behind the goal we were defending in the second half. And just watching Lauren Koscielny really calmly kind of marshal traffic in that back four was just was just it was a real pleasure it honestly it it brought me back to the kind of Sol Campbell Tony Adams type um and you know I again he he didn't make enough obvious interventions I think maybe for it to have really come out on camera but I was just watching him and he was just you know really calm point pointing but not shouting you know just kind of right you go there yep this is coming over here you go there and every time Watford got a free kick we put the defensive line really really high and that was obviously something we did on purpose. And, and I don't think Watford really threatened from set pieces either because from the corners, like I said, we had three up. And when they kept getting those free kicks towards the end, we had the defensive line really, really nice and high. So Leno had loads of space and he didn't have, you know, Troy Deeney wasn't on the pitch, but he didn't have like loads of elbows in his face when he was coming for the ball. And I, I thought um, as much as this game was a bit chaotic, I thought defensively we we really controlled it, and I and I really think that that was that was down, you know, almost entirely to Lauren Koscielny. I, I do think Mustafi actually played quite well um, as well. Particularly, he was good in the air, but I, I, I kind of I I can't help but worry because I just think the two most important players in our team at the moment are Koscielny and Ramsey, and one of them is definitely going. And we don't know how much football we're going to get out of the out of the other one um, mm. next season. So, you know, potentially there's there's all, another big transition in the offing because I was watching this game and I was thinking, imagine if we'd less, left Koscielny out. Um, I don't think we get out of there with three points um, if that's the case. And mm. yeah, I wanted to I wanted to kind of highlight that because I thought he was outstanding. Well, the good news is from a question that I intended to be, you know positive about this match you've made me completely terrified about next season so that's good um we're gonna start to wrap up i I think one thing andrew that all arsenal fans are maybe struggling with a little bit i shouldn't say all arsenal fans because we are by no means a unified voice in any way but uh is how to evaluate obamiang he is such a different type of player than we are used to i mean in this game he scores a goal that he creates just through good hard work and lightning quickness um and then he has chances he blows. He had one XG on the game. To put it in perspective, you know the best striker in the Premier League this season is Sergio Aguero with 0.76 XG per 90. So like having an expected goal per game would make you one of the best players in Europe uh, and the best in the Premier League. And I'm not saying that's where he's at. I'm just trying to put in comparison the fact that like, Again, another game where we might say, oh, Aubameyang, you know, he's not on form. And his finishing certainly doesn't look in form. And yet here he is certainly right there for the golden boot having missed tons of chances, but having created tons of chances. I mean, Mm. do we maybe just have to come to realize that like what is elite about Aubameyang is that he is going to get into an absolute mountain of positions to score goals. And unfortunately, he's only going to convert maybe one of them, but he's going to wind up scoring you 25 goals a season in the league as a result of that. Um, And that that's going to leave you feeling frustrated with him a lot but you know that that is just the player he is i mean do do we have to find a way to evaluate him that doesn't leave us over exaggerating the the negatives of his game yeah i think you know some of the flaws that exist in his game would not be as worrisome if we were a more solid team defensively it's fair. you know because uh you know he misses chances in games and you think jesus we could really do with another goal here uh, because you're not confident that we can keep a clean sheet because we don't keep very many clean sheets. So I think that is part of why he frustrates. Uh, personally, I, I, I really like him. And if he was 23 or 24, he'd drive me mental. He'd drive me crazy. But I think because he's 29, 30, this is who he is. And I, you know, we have to accept that this is who he is. He's going to score you a load of goals. He's going to miss a load of chances. And that's 
that's where we are with him. You know, I don't think at this point he is a leopard whose spots are going to change or his game is not really going to change in any significant way. But as you say, you know, look at the look at the scoring charts. He's in the scrap for the golden boot in the Premier League. He scores a lot of goals. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for the goal he scored the other night. You know, we, we talk about his movement. And we talk about maybe this season where he's scoring more goals from outside the box than he he did certainly in the last couple of years with Dortmund. You know, there's there's been things that he's doing for us uh, this season that that he hasn't really done in the past. So it's not like he hasn't changed or adapted in some ways. But I think he deserves a lot of credit just for the hard work that he puts in. He really does put in a shift. The goal came because he closed down the fullback. He forced the fullback inside. He closed down the goalkeeper. You know, he he used his pace. Um, is maybe the quickest I've seen him move. You know, we we've we've uh, all heard about how how fast he is. But you know, I was maybe when he arrived expecting somebody a little bit faster. Um, which isn't to say he's slow or anything like that, but well, you know, what's weird is don't you hear that in the foot races in training he like he like is the fastest player in the yeah. squad? It just, but, but you're right, he, it doesn't look that way on the pitch all the time. I think he's, I think he's really quick over five, ten, fifteen yards, and you know, on a longer stretch, that's not where he's at his quickest. I think that was evident in the goal that he scored. You know, I I just can't get hung up about a guy who's the age that he is and start demanding things from him that that he's just not capable of giving and if we have a goal scorer who might end up with what 25 30 goals this season and he misses a load of chances it is frustrating but it's great to have that player in the team um where would so, we be without those goals i mean right i mean if, well, if you have a player who's more clinical but scores seven goals fewer a season are you yeah. better off <laughs> you know yeah i mean look, that's it i just don't see the point in in going crazy at him i think he's a really good character as well i like his um i like his attitude i like what he obviously brings to the training ground and to the to the team spirit i think those are important things we can't really measure them of course but i think he is just overwhelmingly a positive character um and he's not somebody who, if he misses a chance, lets his head go down. You know, he will just keep going. I mean, he's clearly used to it himself. You know, he's living it. So um, he is somebody who I understand why he frustrates people. I understand it. You know, there's some times where he misses a chance and you think, how can you be a guy who scores as many goals as you do and you miss that? How? How can you do that? I just don't get it. But it is what it is. And um, I, I feel like... If we are going to achieve what we want to achieve this season in terms of finishing in the top four or or winning the Europa League, that he is a guy who's made a big contribution to that so far and will definitely make a big contribution between now and the end of the season. Yeah, and some of these, I, yeah, yeah, please come back with it. I was just gonna gonna add really, really quickly to that. I think also he works really bloody hard. Um, I think he he chases down, he chases defenders down. Quite often plays out of position, doesn't complain. I, I think um, I think his work rate's really underrated, and and I'd just say, kind of in conclusion, you don't have to choose between Lacazette and Aubameyang. We have both of them. You don't have to keep choosing between them or feel compelled to have a favourite or yeah. to say which one you'd rather sell. We have both of them, and they both have lots of great qualities. They're good friends. They both work their asses off. It's brilliant. Don't feel you have to choose, please. It's driving me mental. Yeah, and we don't want that. Um, I, I think, I, I think it's true. And, and look, I mean, look at the chance Ramsey missed from the penalty spot against Napoli. Right? Players miss those chances. The problem with Aubameyang is he gets so many bloody chances that, like, you know, he doesn't miss one good one. He misses three good ones and puts one away. But do you remember the chance he he made a really quick burst to the near post? In behind the defense, uh, low cross came in and he somehow managed yeah, to blast yeah, yeah. it over the bar. My first reaction is, oh my God, he's missed another sitter. When I watched it back on replay, it's such tremendous movement to get to the spot. And, you know, once you get there, you expect him to finish. But it, it is it is such an interesting duality that he has that his movement and his f explosive first step and his instinct in the box for where to be is so good. And it... it it's because of that that he winds up getting so many chances and he winds up missing so many and it, it, it just can frustrate and I totally understand it but I think we are obviously much better off. I, I don't know if I've mentioned this but Giroud's best ever goal scoring season in the league was 16 goals. So 
you know, something to think about. All right, so we'll we'll <laughs> wrap up maybe with just a little look forward. Oh, one quick word, and we don't have to comment on this, but I think it's worth it. I, I think just another reminder uh, that we may have sort of hit the lottery a little bit with Burn Leno, um, another great – uh, performance, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't think we need to go over the top with him, but he has been very, very important. And you know, as was yeah. said on the Ars cast, when you look at what was spent on Keppa and Allison, I think Keppa's been terrible, but Allison has been quite good. Ederson, very good, but Leno has been a player of the season candidate for us. And yep. given given what we spent on him, you love to see that because it's you know, if you can get a decent goalkeeper without having to spend striker money on him, that's that's how you can build a good team. So. Uh, Come back, Sven. Yeah. And, well, don't joke. That, don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go on a rant. Um, so so let's just look ahead really quickly. I mean, this is a very, very important three points, regardless of how we got there and, and how you feel about it, because I think it puts us in a position now where if we win two home games and one away game, I think we'll be top four. Um, mm. I think that would do it. I think we need Chelsea to lose at United. And if they do that, then I think we're definitely home free. But everybody can look at their spreadsheets and figure that out on their own. Let's let's just talk quickly about the Napoli game. Andrew, um, how do you think he'll set up for it? And what are your expectations? Uh, I think he'll go with the, you know, back to the back three. I think he will play Koscielny. Socrates can obviously come back in as well. Um, we'll see Maitland-Niles and Kolasinac come back in. Ramsey, I think, will play. Torreira and Xhaka will play. Lacazette should play. I, I think he's, I think he's going to set up pretty much as he did in in uh, the last uh, the last home game. Um, you do, so, but do you think Aubameyang and Lacazette will start? No. Okay. I don't think so. I, I have a feeling he might play play Ozil, um, which is maybe surprising away from home. But I just I, I just have a like a, a support goal, striker like a, off Lacazette with Ramsey at 10? Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. so. Maybe so. And I think, you know, we we have every right to be worried because we're away from home and away from home in the Europa League. We've lost to Bate. We've lost to Ren. But, you know, one goal in this game means they have to score four times. So, you know, I think it would be foolish to just sit back. Um, it's hard to resist that temptation when you've got a two-goal lead. But I would be very surprised if he went ultra conservative for this. I think he he knows or has come to the realization that if we're you know if we're strong in any part of the pitch, it's the final third. We've got lots of goal threat, lots of quality there. Napoli didn't look great defensively, and I do think that he's had a look at Napoli now, and I think that played a part in the team selection against Watford. He really wanted his two wing backs fresh. You know, he rested them both and, you know, had he not needed to correct that error, maybe he wouldn't have brought Maitland-Niles on at all. So I think he's looking at targeting um, Napoli down the wings with his wing backs and looking for Ramsey to get in the box, Lacazette to get in the box, uh, maybe Ozil or, or somebody else to be in there as well. So I think he's he's going to have a little bit of a go at them um obviously we 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 don't want to concede early or anything like that but i don't see it as uh, as one of those games where we look at the lineup and think oh he's just going to try and sit and and see out a two goal lead I, I just you know if we do that i think we're in trouble you think we get through i think we had- i am actually quite confident that we will because i think we'll score a goal i think he has to play Aubameyang in this game i mean you very rarely, as Arsenal, get to play fully on the counter. And I think we could be playing a lot on the counter attack in this game. And, true, you, you know, that is one area where you really want to bomb me. I mean, Lacazette is a lot of things and a lot of good things. He's a good in the box finisher. Uh, he holds the ball up pretty well and he presses well. Um, would you play the two of them? Would I you would. Play- I, I would go exactly how he did in the first leg. I'd play Ramsey and Torreira as a midfield two in the back three. I'd play Ozil at 10 and Aubameyang and Lacazette up front. And I think you're going to be playing in transition a lot. Um, mm. I, I'd, I'd still press them on the ball, but I'd probably do it from 10 yards further back than we did in the first game. So just sit in a little deeper, but still be very aggressive with on-the-ball pressure. And the minute there's a transition, get the ball to Ozil and let him play in the strikers. I I think you have to play Aubameyang in a game where a goal wins you the tie, and the other team has to attack. I mean, this this sets up for him, right? Napoli has to attack. They need goals. 
and we are going to have space on the counter. And we have one of the great counterattacking strikers in European football. I think if you don't use him here, why do you even have him? I mean, Tim, is that is that a fair statement as we get ready to say goodbye? It, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure he will, though. I, uh, maybe he will. Um, but, I mean, his, his team selection against Watford, I think, tells you a lot about who's going to play. He's going to play Maitland-Niles and Kolasinac. Um, he only plays them in the back five. Um, he's He took Ramsey off early. He didn't play Ozil. So... Um, you know, those guys are going to play. I I think that Lacazette will start and Aubameyang will be on the bench, personally. But I don't have a strong view as to whether they should both play. You don't have a strong view? No. Well, what are we doing here, then? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have a strong view afterwards. That is the best way to do it. Uh, yeah. And in hindsight, but I don't have one now. Do you think we'll get through? Yes. Okay. I am... Um, I could easily see this being 2-0 Napoli after about 30 minutes, but I still think we'll get through. Uh, I think the power of the away goal will will see it see it happen here. And Tim, I'm sure you just want to send your thoughts and prayers to anyone going to Napoli for this game on behalf of Arsenal yeah. Football Club. Yeah, I've been there, done that. Um, no not thanks. doing it again. Yeah, fair enough. Tim's on Twitter at Stoberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Andrew is on Twitter at Arsblog. Thanks, yeah, Andrew. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, vote for Andrew in the FBAs as the best content no, creator. No, no. He, he's, oh, you can he, save your votes for the Arsenal Vision podcast. No, because you're, you're, you're nominated as best content creator. You've ascended from just podcasting. What does that mean, though? I mean, what does that I mean? It I means don't you what... create a universe of content that Arsenal fans are blessed <laughs> and fortunate to consume uh, and, and do so delightedly. Uh, vote for us for best podcast. You, you win bigger podcasting awards. You, you win, like, the, the real ones. Um, and, and then I, I think everyone should get behind you guys. Thank you. Yeah, you, you don't want to be in front of us, that's for sure. You want to, you want to be right no, behind I, us because um, we're not much to look at. Myself. I might do a pre-match show, uh, by the way, just before kickoff, so look look for news on that as it comes. And anyway, uh, in any event, my name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. Give us a five-star review, all the good stuff. Clive and Paul will be back for the next one, unfortunately. Scott will as well. Uh, and we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Napoli now.